today's adventure. We are here at a cemetery. Come on. And just wanted to come and check out this cemetery. This is a very old cemetery here in Panama City. This is probably one of the oldest cemeteries. Uh, maybe the second or third oldest. Um, there's a lot of uh, people from the Civil War buried here and all the wars and Spanish-American War and you name it. But who I am here to see how they are doing is the founder of Panama City is buried in here. And uh, as you can see, it's just total destruction. Still a lot of shit in here. They've, and part of here, there's uh, been some. Funkin, Funkin, cannot even afford to have a tombstone made, say it was made something out of concrete. There's no date on that. Okay, so, I think it's this way. Madeline's searching very hard. It's an easy uh, tombstone to find. Uh, it's a really big white tombstone. Smash this tree. It's holding up this other tree. Right above the grave site. Made out of trees. Protecting this grave. Jeez, where is it? You would think it would not be that hard to find, seeing how big it was. But it may have been toppled over. There's another handwritten one. Just look at all this craziness in here. Just 
pure fucking destruction. See if that language just pure destruction. No, there's so many unmarked graves. I guess they have who's who on the grave registry. Ah, here it is. Found it. Found it. Railroad executive, promoter, editor, historian. Sounds like me. Hello and welcome to Forgotten Florida. We are at the Panama City Publishing Museum. I've had to say that about five times to get it right. <laughs> we are here with Nancy Hudson, and today we are going to talk about the creation or found, found a, founding of Panama City, Florida, right. and its original founder, George Mortimer West. Correct. So, without further ado, uh, Nancy, please just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with Mr. West and everything like that. Okay, well that goes it's back a mouthful, a, it, sorry, yeah, sorry. It goes back a long way, so I'll try to shorten it a little bit. I I met Buddy West when I first came here to get some printing done, probably about nineteen ninety one. And Buddy West is the great great grandson of George. And um, so I've known Buddy for thirty one years now. And then in the 2000s, 2000 to 2009, the community was working really hard to revitalize. And we were able to purchase this building from Buddy in 2005. The city bought it, turned it into a museum. We restored the building with a grant from the state of Florida. Opened back up in 2008. And I think at that time, I probably didn't Nobody really knew a whole lot about George. I mean, we've read the obituary in the old newspapers, but uh, then a couple of years ago, I got into the local history room at the library, and they have his diaries that range, they start in 1873. Wow. And go until the day he died in 1926. Wow, that's amazing. So I read through all of his diaries and transcribed um, that was quite a journey but you know we always just kind of had George on a pedestal founding father of Panama City okay railroad executive well I don't know about that I mean he worked hard and the the diaries just revealed so much about his personal life starting in Escanaba when he worked for the railroad how he first came here in 1887, what it meant to him to now have a Southern home. One of my favorite parts is when he wrote in his diary in the 1880s, before he started working on creating Panama City, he wrote, and he was in his 40s, he wrote, I wish I could find something to take hold of to make something of. 
Oh. And it just, um, it just hooked me. It's a good quote right there. And the tragedy in his life uh, is, I, I don't know how he overcame everything that he went through. So um, let's let's backtrack a little bit. What what spurred him to leave? You said Michigan, right? Yes, Escanaba, so, Michigan. Talk about that, and then uh, talk about the, the tragedy. Uh, this is this is all news to us. So. He worked for the railroad, um, Chicago and Northwestern in Escanaba, and he worked for them for about forty years until 1901. And then he spent five years in Chicago with the Chicago Transfer Terminal Railway until 1906 when he came here permanently. And in... So let me break then okay. right there. What was here in 1906 when he came here? What, what would have... If we could okay. teleport back in time, what would what would be what would be here? St. Andrews would be here. St. Andrews was here. Uh, they St. Andrews had been reviving ever since the war between the states. Of course, Lambert Ware came here in 1879, built the mercantile and the dock. So George was here during that time period, starting in 1887. He was here every year for several months during the winter time. But 1906, um, so 1907, they would have been building the Bank of St. Andrews down here on the corner. Um, there were a number of buildings here and businesses. St. Andrews actually incorporated in 1908. Oh, wow. And so it was actually an incorporated town by then. And then, of course, Panama City incorporated in 1909. But 1906, when George came here, the 100 acres that's now downtown Panama City was mostly dirt. There was two, three, maybe four buildings down there. There had been a couple of goes at making it in a, to a town. Mm -hmm. Harrison, Park Resort, um, Demarest and Jinx, who had bought the area and platted it. And then that's who George got it from through his Gulf Coast Development Company. But it was hit the opportunity because Escanaba, Michigan is located on Lake Michigan and the shipping and the rail yard was just such an economic so engine. he saw that potential here immediately. He saw uh, the potential here hmm. when he saw St. Andrews Bay. So um, you mentioned the tragedy. So what, what tragedies or what, you know, what, what was the catalyst in his life or whatever? Wow, there, there were a lot. In 1859, um, his younger twin sister, it wasn't his twin, he had twin sisters, um, Ellen and Helen. One of them died in 1859 from diphtheria. Then his older brother and other sister died in 1861. There was nobody left but George. And like his Aunt Maria wrote to him, you know, God spared you so that your parents would have someone to care for them in their aging years. Mm -hmm. um, he had a son uh, born to him in 1868, and, and Charles uh, grew up, worked for the railroad like his father did, but, um, and then had two children, he was married, but Charles died around age 26. Oh, so young. Wow. So young, and then just three or four years later, Charles's wife died. George ended up raising his two grandchildren. Oh, wow. Among everything else he was doing, working for the railroad, um, dreaming of something that he could make something of. So, and so what was that thing that brought him down here? Just that he was coming down here and he saw the opportunity and he's like, this is it, this is what I've been looking for? He made a lot of friends over the years when he kept coming here during the winter time. One of them was Hawk Massalina. Yeah. who taught him to hunt and fish this area and navigate the bay. Um, and they were very good friends and they spent a lot of time together. Lambert Ware, a um, number of other people that he mentions in his diaries on a regular basis and the things they did together. But I think the impetus was George was actually let go from the railroad in 1900 mm. and 1901, the year starts off and he got a job with the Chicago Transfer Terminal Railroad and that lasted five years and he'd had enough. Mm. Um, railroading was very dangerous, very difficult. 
um, not pleasant a lot of times. Right. Yeah, it's explosions, a lot of things. Uh, the injuries to people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he had been witness to many train wrecks um, and, you know, just a lot of terrible things that had happened. And he was responsible most of the time for the timetable that he would establish what trains would be running on what tracks at what time so you didn't have two trains running in mm. together. Mm. So to call him an executive, I don't know. <laughs> I know that timetable stuff is pretty difficult. Yeah, yeah. So now let's talk about, so he gets to Panama City and, and how does he go about like actually making it a thing? I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy to turn dirt into something. So. You know, George had a gift of being able to write and to appeal to people and provide them with a paper of some kind of a proposal that would make sense. And he had been pushing Panama City quite a bit. Um, now why but Panama it wasn't, City though? But why, it, and why the yeah. name Panama City? I wanna, I wanna talk about that. Yeah, let's get back to there. So St. Andrews was here, there was dirt down there, his company, Gulf Coast Development Company, and buys Millville the land. Was already successful. Millville was there. Yeah. And so George found a railroader in Georgia, A.B. Steele. He got him to build the railroad. It ended at Cottondale. Steele built the last 64 miles from Cottondale to what ended there on Beach Drive in what he and George named Panama City. Now there's a map that George had put together and it shows how all the rail lines in the country can converge and meet at this. He saw this as the southern gateway to the country. And then from there, the Panama Canal was being built and would open in 1914. From there, you had access to the world shipping. So rail to Panama City, shipping worldwide and specifically to the Panama Canal. So it was part of the marketing. It was part of the marketing, yep. Um, somebody, uh, and I don't know if this is uh, true, but someone told me that another reason is that because we are actually on the same longitude as Panama City, Panama. I don't know if that's true or not. I can check later on that. Check on that because I know I've <laughs> Anybody seen- Anybody got a globe? <laughs> we need a globe. I know that when you look at this map and the line goes straight down from Panama City, you you have to jut out around the Yucatan. Right. And I don't remember ever looking to see if it was a straight line, actually. Right. So that's a good question. We'll, have to, we'll get back on that. Um, so let's talk about, um, so we're here in, in this publishing building. Right. How is this connected to George West? Well, after George got, at the same time, actually, that George was getting the railroad built and, Pan and Panama City started, he, he platted the town and he set aside land for parks, for churches, for the courthouse. Um, he built the first city dock that was where Panama City Marina has been for the last few years. He, he built the women's club building downtown for the women to gather in. He built a men's club for the men to gather in. And he built a building thousand square feet specifically for printing the Panama City Pilot, the first newspaper for Panama City. Mm. So he got into that printing plus doing commercial printing, you know, letterhead, um, invoices. He would print those kinds of things, ballots for the early elections. Was he connected to the wood business at all? I mean, was this another avenue of money for him? Or he just saw, hey, we need a newspaper. We need things for people to he do. He knew we needed a newspaper and through the newspaper, he could promote this area. Right. A lot of those newspapers got sent north to right. Chicago and Michigan. I've read a lot of them too, the advertisements, you know. Yes. Um, fish, sunny, you know, and they're advertising the warmth and everything. Yes, and breeze and great that. lots. Come on, we can sell you a lot down mm -hmm. here. So he um, was printing the newspaper, but then things sort of, um, yeah, he was a newspaper man. He was a journalist. So things sort of got a little rubby because as Panama City was growing and the local governments would do their things, 
journalists would actually try to report the facts of what was happening. And once Panama City was incorporated in 1909, he reported on some things that they were doing and, and that the sheriff was doing that were not legal. Mm -hmm. And actually in the 1920s, Florida ended up adopting a lot of legislation related to journalism because the newspaper publishers were being threatened so much. And George was reporting these things. So and not everybody loved George. So George was uh, an investigative reporter, I guess, before his time. And he was, he was. So even though it was his city, he was not, he was not scared to show the sauces being made. No. At all. He, he called things as they were. That's interesting. He, you would think he'd be trying to whitewash everything and everything's fine here. You know, no. nothing to look at. He didn't he didn't do that. He he called it like it was. That's and he, amazing. So I he made not, some enemies. That. Now then what happened was also in nineteen thirteen, he he threw and I say he, through his Gulf Coast Development Company, had paid the fee and gotten Bay County carved out of Washington County. So he actually was responsible for Bay County coming into existence. And is there, how did we come up, is there any record of why the name Bay County was, I mean, obviously we have a beautiful bay. Probably was, because of St. Andrews Bay. Right. And he had a great grandson that they called Bay. Oh. So I don't know. That's cool. Um, but he was responsible for Bay County as well. And then getting back to how we ended up here, so 1916, George has politicians angry with him. They burn, they, he said in the paper that it was probably arson. His building downtown was burned. Mm -hmm. His printing equipment and everything was lost. Mm -hmm. So he and Lillian in the middle of the night, Lillian West, his third wife, they come down here. There was a building just a lot over from here where the St. Andrews Bay News was being printed. They got use of that building and then within two weeks he had bought the newspaper and um, was leasing the building and the equipment to print both of his newspapers. Oh wow. And then in 19... So he really showed them, huh? Yes. They couldn't shut him down. He says, I'll, yeah, I'll print two papers. <laughs> the more you tell me about this guy, the more I love him. He is such a great guy. He's, he is amazing. Like I said, his diaries just revealed so much more than a guy on the pedestal as a founding father. You know, and, and, you, and you go to his tombstone and you see promoter and all yes. these titles. And when you think of promoter, a lot of us, you know, have this kind of uh, idea of like, you know, he's a used car salesman of his day or something, but this was someone with a vision, with a heart, you know, and yes. with courage. And, yes. And, um, and, you know, he never even really took the attention. He never wanted attention. He never took credit. He didn't, he, he just didn't. He always put the spotlight on other people. Like when A.B. Steele built the railroad, George just talked about A.B. Steele and the railroad. He didn't say, I got him here. Yeah. He never, he never was that wow. kind of guy. So 1918, George and Lillian started building this building. Lillian, actually three quarters owner, at a time when in rural Florida, this was not typical. Mm -hmm. You know, women might own property and businesses in Atlanta or Jacksonville, but not in rural Panhandle, Florida. Right, right. And she was really right in the middle of everything, running the newspaper, the business end of it, um, writing the articles, editorials. Um, she sold lots for the Gulf Coast Development Company. Somebody, you know, somebody was interested, she, she could sell a lot. And now is that who built the log cabin that's on Beach Drive? Lillian built the log cabin. George passed away in 1926 and mm -hmm. she built the cabin in the 1930s. So they built this and about 10 years later he passes away. How, how did he pass away? Um, I think from what I can tell from the diaries because he, he talks about the doctor coming to see him and what medicines he's taken. I think he had a number of illnesses but and I'm not a doctor, 
but it sounds like a congestive heart failure. Mm. And he was about 81 years old. He was about to be 81. Um, and so in 1926, they build the the log cabin, I guess, on Beach Drive. 1930s. 1930s. Lillian built that. She moved out of the West Home, that's two houses over, and uh, lived in the log cabin the rest of her life till 1970. And my whole life, I have driven by that cabin and not know the story, not known the story behind it, other than, man, who built a log cabin in front of all these mansions? It's awesome, I you know. I know, I know. <laughs> but the fact that it has survived and has survived several hurricanes and survived, yes. God knows what else, since 1930 or something like. It's, it's amazing that it's still there. In fact, it, is. it only took recent damage in Hurricane Michael, right? It, it knocked the chimney off, I think, the only thing. Yeah, it knocked a couple of stones off the chimney and, uh, of course, had to get a new roof put on it, yeah, I think like they, everybody they, else. Yeah, I think they deleted the root, the uh, chimney. He they, did. So we, we had talked earlier about how uh, George was, he had his finger in almost every pie. And even education here. So, t- he did. How, how how was he involved in Panama City education system? So he built the first Panama City school, which was downtown. That's not the one that's still not the high school. No, it was a wooden building. Mm-hmm. It was close to McKenzie Park, mm-hmm. and it was later moved to Seventh Street in Harrison, and then was moved to what we know today as the Garden Club. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And is actually incorporated into that building today. Oh, interesting. That's it's very a, interesting. It's a part of that Garden Club building. That's right. My mom lives in the neighborhood right there. Okay. Off the wood there. So, you know, um, he just, he did so much and he had so many interests. We like to call him a Renaissance man. We have his telescope here. Start, it was made in France in the 1880s. Wow. He would observe the planets and the stars and the moon. Um, he would invite people down to the house on the beach to, to view through his telescope. He was a photographer. He started that in 1884. Um, therefore, Panama City is fortunate to have just a myriad of photographs in our local history room at the library that document what this area looked like. And if George not done that, we would not have a glimpse. I mean, pictures of Hawk Messalina, pictures of the beaches here and, and people in buildings. It's just Those are phenomenal. All his photos. Wow. There's a lot. I think we ended up, there's probably about 750 photos that he had taken that are in the collection between here and the library. That's amazing. And we've shared those with the library. So they're all digitized. That's amazing. And uh, anybody can take a look at those. Um, and you know, his diary documenting the history of this area and what he did to bring Panama City into existence. Um, Lisa walked out. Okay. okay, and continue on. Sorry, we had uh, someone walk out of the building. <laughs> so he, um, through his diary, you know, we've got this never before seen or read documentation of everything that he did in creating Panama City. Now, Panama City had railroad. St. Andrews didn't get railroad till 1914. At one point, people actually accused him of not supporting St. Andrews because his focus had been so heavy on Panama City. But he did support St. Andrews and he was actually a resident of St. Andrews. Lillian was the first woman registered to vote in St. Andrews. That's amazing. 1920. That's awesome. So finally we get the railroad in 1914. It ran right here by the building and dead ended at the water down here. There was a, there was a terminal down here. They would ship fish for the commercial fishermen. There were two or three fish houses down here employing hundreds of people. And of course the mail, there was a contract with the government to run the mail. But it turns out Walter Sherman became owner of this railroad, part owner. And in 1920, he and Lillian and George were at odds about this rumor of annexing St. Andrews into Panama City. 
George and Lillian wanted St. Andrews to maintain its independence. Walter Sherman wanted Panama City to annex Millville, St. Andrews, and there was a couple of other little spots. Why, why did he want that? Panama City was failing financially, and, and they who needed was Walter the time. He was just a businessman. He was a businessman. He owned the lumber mill in Millville, mm -hmm. and had a lot of other interests. Uh, he was in business some with Minor Keith, who had the fruit company, mm -hmm. and they were not fans of George and Lillian. Mm -hmm. So and then, when the lumber mill workers would go on strike, George and Lillian wrote in their paper supporting the workers right. and their right to work. And so Walter Sherman didn't like that either. So 1920, Walter Sherman said, well, I'll just fix y'all. And he cut off the railroad to St. Andrews. Wow. He stopped running trains, even though he had government contracts. You know, the government tells a train, a railroad, what they can do. Right. And he was under these contracts, but he did it anyway. And then went to whatever commission um, a few months later and actually it was permanently shut down. You know, affected the shift, fish business, um, affected St. Andrews because there were passengers that would come into here too and cargo. So, um, so Walter did that and you know, that just fueled the fire between the three of them. And then in 1925, I believe it was in October or November, um, the legislature actually approved the annexation of St. Andrews and Millville into Panama City. It went into effect in March of 1926. Mm -hmm. And George and Lillian put an article in the newspaper, and I would bet that Lillian wrote it. I can't promise you, I just know it's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hail Caesar, those who salute you are about to die. Wow. In the midnight hour of the legislature. And then she goes on and talks about what was done and what a crushing blow to this community. Mm. So that's... And so even though Sherman got his way, he never turned the railroad back on or anything. No, they completely done out of spite and left. Actually, Mrs. Drummond, mm -hmm. the wife of J.H. Drummond, who was first mayor of Panama of St. Andrews, uh, Mrs. Drummond had called George and told him the trestle at Baker Bayou was on, was burning; it was on fire. So Walter Sherman had actually set the railroad trestle that went over what we know as Lake Caroline. Wow! Um, he had actually just set it on fire, and of course those. Those timbers burn very easily. Of course, yeah. So it was um, it was pretty. Um, so he made some permanent solutions to. Yes. Wow. Today, I mean, he he served no prison time. He got in no trouble for that. That would have been like major or something. I mean, basically, he was committing terrorism. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, it's you know but violent. Yeah. And, and that's just the. I guess that's like. Maybe that's the formation of like the, the Bubba system here in, uh, in Bay County, you know, you just do what you want to do type thing. There, there were some things that went on. Part of, part of it was um, that Panama City had established a road bond fund for specifically building named roads. I mean, they, they listed what roads they mm -hmm. would spend the money on. There was, I don't know, three or four hundred thousand dollars in this fund. There was George wrote, "There's no accounting for where a hundred thousand dollars has gone." And then there was the story that um, he published, where there was a train loaded with gravel for building the roads, and it was headed to St. Andrews. And Minor Keith told the engineer and the conductor. No, take it up this track and go dump it at this road. Well, they did what he said, but it was Minor Keith's road. Mm. It was not one of the roads that was supposed to be built with the road bond money. Mm. So, and what road was that? do we know what road that was? It was, it was going from Lynn Haven, from Millville to Lynn Haven. So, my, you know, I'm envisioning. 
some Kevin somewhere up there between Harrison and 77, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So that was interesting. So much dirt. So much dirt. It's I, you, you told me so much I had no idea. That's a, it's amazing. Well, and you, you know, can really read the entire history of Panama City if you read the newspapers. That's the other thing. We've got the photographs from George, but these newspapers, they document people. They document, you know, the events of government and development here, social, religious. They, it, it's, it's an incredibly valuable documentation starting in 1907 all the way to 1937 because that's how long Lillian continued mm -hmm. publishing. It's a complete document documentation of our local history. That's amazing. And these are it's, at the and they're still at the local history museum most of them or The newspapers are actually digital online. You can go to the flhiddentreasures.com mm -hmm. and all of our local I've newspapers been on that. are there. That's a great site. It's an amazing it's website site. to and provide some great, great access. Photography. I've used that um, several times uh, already in the series. Yeah. Um, so you wrote a book on I Mr. Did. West. What, what's it called? George Mortimer West, His Path in History. And, and if uh, people would like to buy it, uh, can they come here? Is it online? How can they get it? It's online. You can also pick it up here at the Publishing Museum or the Bay County History Museum downtown, which, you know, the sales help support these two facilities if you buy it locally. Okay. And then you don't have to wait for it. So if you're in the area, and uh, we are, what's the address here? We're on uh, St. Andrews Boulevard, right? Or 1134 Beck Avenue. 1134 Beck Avenue, mm -hmm. downtown St. Andrews. Stop by, what are the hours? Tuesday through Friday, 1 to 5.30. Saturday mornings, 9 to 1. You heard it. So this has been a, a great interview. Thank you <laughs> for been your fun. time. I learned so much. Um, I hope you guys learned about Panama City as well. And, um, you know, I think it's interesting, you know, we, we have not lost our roots of having to promote and market ourselves to stay alive and to attract yeah. others to what we love and, you know, and it's still going on today. Um, you know, the St. Andrews is still thriving. They're still doing fishing charters out of here. Yep. Um, obviously the beach takes a lot of the focus now of what Panama city and tourism and everything is, but this was where it was at, uh, at the turn of the century. So um, thank you for sharing that time with us. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. So this is uh, George West's office. And where would he have sat in this chair here? This, actually the chair. The actual chair, his elbows put in the time there, huh? And that's Mr. West there. Mm -hmm. Not sure how long that will show up. And that's his telescope there. That is. And his lantern projector. Has this been refurbished at all? This is all original. The carpet. This is original. All the carpet and everything is original there. Mm -hmm. And then what are we looking at here? Seven encyclopedias that belong to George. Turn of the century. Turn of the century encyclopedia. That is amazing. It's not Wikipedia. <laughs> Before Google, kids, this is what you had to do. You actually had to open a book. <laughs> and so what would, what, what, what do you have here? What, is this is her handwriting here, possibly? And this is the original floor? Uh, it is. Let me look. I don't know whose handwriting this is. Why she made? Whoever the secretary was of the Gulf Coast Development Company, because this was their minutes from their meeting. And these are whose glasses would have these have been? Those are Lillian's. Those are those glasses, huh? Wow, that's amazing. And this is. Uh, George, George's typewriter, uh, 1893. So, did you watch? This is an upstrike. See the arm come up? Mm -hmm. 
when it hits, it's on the underside of the roller. You can't see what you've typed until it gets about three or four lines up. Oh, Lord. They quickly changed this design. Yeah, to the, to the roller style. <laughs> These are cool. <clears throat> These buttons that George made. Boost Panama City Worlds. What does it say? Best golf, largest best golf port. Largest best golf port. And then, so we have these receipts, I guess, or. Yep, from the Gulf Coast Development Company. That's awesome. It's hard to tell on camera, but the floor is actually beautiful. Well, George wrote in his diary that he was not pleased with the tile work. Really? He really did. And and I'm not sure why. Um, you know, floor has settled over the years. So I don't, you know, I think this is... It is more of a bathroom tile look. Maybe that's what he didn't like about it. It is, but then I wonder, some places I see some some weaving mm -hmm. and I wonder if that was what he was referring to but think about it these are tiny little what three quarter inch mm -hmm. yeah maybe half inch I and think. today we buy those in a 12 by 12 sheet from Lowe's mm -hmm. and back then these guys were in here putting this in tile by tile yep you can tell too the, the way the grout, you know, some grout is, you know, it's just, you know, they like did their best. You can tell it. I mean, there's places where it doesn't line up at all, but. Yeah, and like I said, I don't know how much of it is settling or if it was, you know, if it was that way back then when it's done. And the fireplace and everything was all, is still all it's original. It's, it's, I wonder how many fires he sat, you know, writing next to. You know, That's probably it. quite a few, and when his health was starting to fail, he was actually sitting here and passed out one time. He woke up on the floor. He remembered the feeling of falling, he wrote in his diary. But then he woke up on the floor and was warm from the fire. Um, now, off camera, you had mentioned there had been attempts on his life, so yeah. let's talk about that real quick. There were at least three attempts on his life, um, and this is why in the 1920s Florida legislature said we got to do something about protecting journalism and the newspaper publishers. Um, one attempt, uh, he got a letter from a fella, and it was on Lynn Haven letterhead. Um, he said he had heard and the money had been paid. They were going to do something to George worse than death. Then there was another attempt that they were going, somebody was going to put him at the bottom of the Chattahoochee River. And the other attempt was that a Panama City councilman had um, contacted his buddy in Lynn Haven, who was head of the KKK. He had told the councilman, oh, we're gonna ride through St. Andrews on Sunday, we've got 35 cars. And the councilman said, while you're down there, have it George West, too. Hmm. Why? So what the, the, What was his beef with that councilman, do you know? Um, you know, I really haven't gone back and looked to see what was going on with that specific councilman. It could have been the road bond money. It could have been... Um, you know, any number of things that were going on that George was reporting that the city and the county were doing. Journalism has always been a dangerous business. So. I, you know, it brought it to light that it really, really was back then and even today. It's, um, it's it just being in the presence, uh, just of the cutout is impressive in here, really. Um, you know, to be talking about him and have him basically looking at us uh, as we talk about him is really impressive. Yeah, he's, um, we were able to bring George and Lily into life uh, with these cutouts. 
in the museum, so it really does make you feel more like you have more of a connection with it. And so, as we mentioned earlier, Lillian was the first woman to register to vote in Bay County, in St. Andrews. Probably one of the first in the whole state, probably, too. I mean, I mean. I'm sure she was right down there on the opening day. <laughs> I'm one sure. One minute after the office opened up where she could vote. Where she uh, I love this watch that she has on. Well, Lillian always only wore two things. One was a man's watch, and the other was that cameo pen. So she wore a man's watch and a cameo pen. She did. And she wore pretty industrial men's shoes. She carried a wallet with a rubber band around it in her big front pockets. Wow. She'd keep a wallet in one. And I've heard some stories of when she had a 22 pistol in the other one. I, I can see that. I love the look on her face, too. She has such that, that smirk, you know, that she has. <laughs> like, you know, like she's got something going on, you know. I love that smirk that she has. Yeah, we did a we did a video about Lillian a couple of years ago, and one of the gentlemen that we interviewed was Lee Cowan. Lee had worked for Lillian mm -hmm. back around 1938-1940. He was a young boy at the time, and one of the things he said in his interview, which he was in his 90s when we interviewed him, he said. You know, I don't know how she knew everything, but she knew everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that look on her face, you can tell that, yeah, she does. She's got the dirt on you. <laughs> she, she knew everything, he said. She looks like a, a very, just like, kind of, I don't know, the woman that you'd automatically just befriend, you know. She just has that, like, very, like, kind of warm, warm attractiveness to her. You know, she supported, she supported young boys in getting their education and, in, and then working and learning this trade of printing. And I mean, I've heard stories of her and the boys that work for her and she told them, if you'll graduate from high school, I'll pay for your college. Oh, that's amazing. And, you know, it's kind of some unknown things. Lillian's got quite a reputation. Her driving was terrible. You can see the video on our website. Uh, it's uh, all about Lillian West. But she, um, she had quite the reputation for being pretty bold, outspoken, driving really bad. But, and there's a lot of stories about that. And they're in that video. But I saw another side to Lillian um, going through the West documents that we have in our collection and in reading George's diary. Um, in particular, the great-great-grandson, you know, the great-grandson, George Francis West. There were four great-grandsons. George Francis West served in the Navy in World War II. Mm -hmm. He was lost off of Trinidad. Lillian had the last letter from him in May, 1942-ish, I think. And then um, his ship was lost. So George was gone. We found a letter Lillian wrote to George in 1953 and she mailed it to Trinidad well, it was returned to her as undeliverable because he was not known. Mm -hmm. But she wrote to him and said, I have your letter in my desk and I look at it every day. I still hope for you to come home like you said you would. Oh, wow. Well. Did we ever find that letter by chance? Um, we have George's letter to her and we have the letter that she wrote That's amazing. to him That's that was amazing. returned. And it was just so touching. She was, as, as much as she had this incredible reputation for, you know, her boldness, mm -hmm. she would walk right in to the bank president's office or the supervisor of elections or the clerk of court. She didn't wait for her secretary. She'd just march in and say, I need.